Hello, everyone, and, and welcome. Great. We're getting a little bit of a late start to some technical glitches, but um, I think we also will go a little long on the back end so we can have a great session. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Clayton Lane. I'm um, the Deputy Director of the Sustainable Cities Center at the World Resources Institute. And uh, I would like to welcome you to the most fun, cool session at all of Transforming Transportation. You're in the right place. In case you haven't already, please leave everything you thought you knew about the car at the door. Because here we will talk about the future of the automobile and all of its complementary services, both in planning and operation, technology is transforming transportation. Um, the urban motori motorized mobility of tomorrow may be completely different. It may be much smarter, more accessible, more shared, more democratized, more economically productive, more sustainable. So today we'll hear from experts and innovators in the field. We'll hear about car sharing. We'll hear about technology to help map buses and measure accessibility and plan transit, technology to make mini buses more demand responsive in real time. We'll hear about the future of transport. And I think there's a big potential here that things really could change for the better, that we really could be talking about leapfrogging, that in many households in less developed countries, it'll be much easier to skip that whole car ownership thing and go straight to other more shared modes of mobility, walking, biking, and transit much more easily than we have been able to in the more developed parts of the world. Uh, I think there's great promise of greater access to mobility with less driving at the same time. So I'd like to introduce our participants today and then just introduce what I think are two or three big themes that are happening in this space. Um, I'll start from my, from my far left. Actually, I should tell you who I am as well. I mentioned my name is Clayton Lane uh, with WRI. Um, uh, a while back, I, when I studied at MIT, I did my thesis on accessibility planning in cities and the data needed to measure accessibility for planning. That was like 20, 15 years ago. Um, we're finally getting to a point where that may actually happen for real, that we can start making decisions based on accessibility. I also was a co-founder of Philly Car Share in Philadelphia and I'm currently now the deputy director of our city's center at WRI. So from my far left, uh, starting with Shomik Mendirata. Speak Italian, Mendirata. Mendirata. Uh, Shomik is a lead urban transport specialist working at the World Bank with experience across Latin America, Asia, and Africa. He's currently working on transport and smart mobility and sustainability issues primarily in Latin America. He's been at the World Bank since, since 2002. Um, and for a few years, he lived and worked in China. He's also co-editor and author of, of a, an edited book on low carbon urban development in China. Thank you so much for being here, Shomik. Uh, next to my left, working from my left, is Hussein Oroglu from Istanbul. Uh, Hussein is a manager at the IETT Transit Agency. It's a government owned company that operates Istanbul's public transport buses, including Metrobus, BRT. Um, which carries 800,000 passengers a day, which I think is the highest or second highest in the world of any BRT line. Uh, he also will tell us about a very interesting app that's allowing customers in Istanbul to see in real time where the buses are and when they will arrive. Um, next from my left, I'm yes? The manager, I'm a manager. You are a manager. a manager. <laughs> and a, a very modest person as well. You are a manager, thank you for correcting me. Um, next we have Dr. Jehek O, oh, and I hope I've gotten your name pronounced correctly. Uh, he is vice president of the Korea Transport Institute. Dr. O oh is, um, he's currently working in the Office of Future Transport and Creative Economy. Uh, since 1992, he has project managed more than 60 of Cote's transport projects. He's played a key role in innovating transport systems for green growth and formulating infrastructure policies for the Korean government. At present, he's an editorial board member of the Journal of Transport Policy, which I understand, I believe, has a, a, a special edition later this year on shared mobility. You know, okay, well, I, I'm pretty sure this is happening. Uh, next, from my left, very, we're very excited to have Ana Paula Blanco with us. She is the General Director of Communications in Latin America for Uber. 
Um, prior to Uber, she led Google's global communications for Spanish-speaking Latin America. She has over 15 years of experience in General Electric, Citibank, the Mexican Association of Stockbrokers uh, as a communications expert. And last and certainly not least is uh, Robin Chase, who is also a board member of WRI. Uh, she is a transportation entrepreneur uh, whose work focuses on ways in which technology can be used to maximize efficient use of expensive resources. And just a few highlights of her entrepreneurial endeavors include being a founder of Zipcar, today the, large, the world's largest car sharing company, the founder of GoLoco, an online ride sharing community that has helped people quickly arrange to share trips, car trips, the founder of Buzzcar, a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing network in France. She leads Meadow Networks, which advises transportation and planning on wireless and mesh networking applications and transport. And of course, she lectures widely, often featured in major media. She was recognized as Startup Woman of the Year, uh, Business Week's Top 10 Designers, Fast Company's Fast 50 Champions of Innovation, and many more things. And most importantly, she too is a graduate of MIT. <laughs> um, so I will just give a very quick overview of a few themes, and then I'll ask Robin to start, and we'll go from there. Um, I think it's such an exciting time for us now in technology and shared mobility in particular. Um, the first thing I think is such big news is there has been enormous investments in the past 18 to 24 months in this space. Um, I think over $3 billion of investment into shared mobility, a lot in the VC capital space, and of course we don't have data on that, but it's pretty large, but also numbers like 70 million investment from Citibank into bike sharing in New York, 200 million from SoftBank into Ola in India, uh, 450 million from Avis into Zipcar, more or less. Uber is now valued at $40 billion. So big things are happening, and that is leading to a second theme, which is a lot of innovation and growth. Very impressive. New models of car sharing, bike sharing, ways to share expensive ac assets. In San Francisco alone, there are 14 shared mobility services in one city. It is, it is the future of mobility in many ways. And the third thing that's happening is a big emergence of these modes, much more in less developed countries. A lot of this has started in Europe and in the United States, but now is being transformed by innovators. And we see a lot that's happening in China, in India, in Brazil. China, in just a few years, went from having no bike sharing to having more bike sharing than the rest of the world combined. And now they're starting also with car sharing, and we'll see where this goes as well. Very exciting things. And I just want to paint the picture of the diversity of what this field is all about now. You probably all know about classic car sharing. Zipcar, for example, now Zoom in Bangalore. You probably know about bike sharing, like Cabi here in Washington, or Ecobici in Mexico City, or the 80,000 bike system in Hangzhou, China. You may know about one-way car sharing, like Car2Go here, or Drive Now. Less of you probably have heard about peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, where you can use your neighbor's car right in the neighborhood and pay by the hour for that. There are also the transportation network com companies, the so-called TNCs like Uber and Lyft, which are transforming the whole taxi industry by, by democratizing it, by making it more social, where all of us can participate in supplying that transport. There's also the movement towards smart paratransit, the idea that the minibus now can be much smarter with real-time information can respond to demand in real time uh, to be much more effective at carrying the masses of people. And then there are all of the app portals, all of the apps that we can use uh, to find how we get around and use all these different modes. There's companies like Karma that provides real-time prearranged carpooling, like Ride Amigos that does trip planning and TDM management, or Ride Scout that wants to become the kayak of urban mobility, where they, they're thinking that when you sign up for their service, you also will, will gain a membership in all of the shared mo use mobility services, and it will predict when you need them and tell you where they are and even unlock the door for you. So there is all sorts of innovation even well beyond that. I will try to, well, I will stop now so I can really preserve a lot of time for you because I'd like to hear your, your questions and comments and for our presenters here. So with no further ado, I will invite Robin up to the stage. Thanks so much. My long commute. <laughs> I feel like, can you hear me? Um, I feel like I am going to be um, 
doing a relatively large overview, so if it looks like I'm not going towards transportation, don't worry, I veer back into transportation. So this session is, um, so technology is transforming mobility everywhere, and the question is, can it, will it enhance sustainable mobility? Maybe, if we take it in that direction, can go other directions, and it also has the potential for more inclusion, again, if we make that choice, if we go do that. It's not necessarily the case. This chart is one of my favorite when I think about what the future of transportation is going to look like. We're sitting in Washington, D.C., which I don't even think appears on this, but this is the population density per square kilometer in cities that we know and love, and most of them are cities that, in fact, we don't know and don't love because we don't live in them. All those ones down there at the bottom that are incredibly dense. So this idea that we're going to have private cars are going to have any place in the future of dense urban cities that we know is the future is ridiculous, and this is shown by this. So in New York City, 50% of the households don't own cars. In Paris, 40% of the households don't own cars. In Mexico City, 44% don't own cars, and it should, of course, be much lower if you've been there and seen the traffic congestion. So these future cities that are very dense are not going to have personal private cars. What we know is we really need to share, have many more shared assets. So if I think about this, you know, just on-street parking, these cars are parked on street and they're moved 5% of the time and stored 95% of the time in the most prime of areas of our cities. If you had to pay, so in Boston where I have these numbers, um, it's $250,000 to buy one open air parking spot on Beacon Hill and you can get a $7 a year parking fee, parking permit. Like it is crazy how we've got this rationalized. So it's, these sharing, share, shared everything is what I'm very focused on and where I think these cities are gonna go. If I look to, if, and we look here, Zipcar and Car2Go and Velib and Scoot, these are all examples of these shared things that are happening. And so we're seeing it happening more and more and what is underpinning this? Because I think it's happening in every sector and that's what I wanna talk about today. Um, so if I think about Zipcar and why we were successful, there are three components that I think we're seeing in all of these shared asset things and that we're seeing in every sector of the economy. First off is they start with leveraging excess capacity. Excess capacity meaning something that's already been bought and already exists. And because you're leveraging excess capacity, the economics are completely transformed. So if we think about the car, there's two ways you could buy cars before. You would own it, and as I say, you would pay $9,000 a year, use it only 5% of the time, which is a crazy way to spend your money, $25 a day, day in, day out whether or not you took the subway to work every day, or you could buy it in these 24-hour bundles, which was very expensive. So if you wanted to only have a car for one hour or 26 hours, that was impossible in the old days. So leveraging excess capacity meant that I knew the economics of car vehicle ownership were broken. It was gonna be transformed. The second thing we did is we built a platform for participation. We had to make it really, really simple for people to be able to share these assets. That is key. You can't share excess capacity without it being totally trivial. And that's what, that's, a, key aspect. And the third is we thought of our members as collaborators. It was no longer us on one side of the car rental counter and you on the other side and knowing that you were oppositional and that you hated each other and each side was trying to screw the other. In fact, we thought of our customers as our collaborators in this. And just looking at these photos, what strikes me is when you have your firstborn child and you're leaving in the hospital, the idea that you're saying, oh honey, let's go take a photo and mail it into Zipcar, that only happens when they are really your collaborators, not your opponents. Um, here, this uh, great cartoon that I found. This, so we started Zipcar in 2000, but today this cartoon is completely obvious. Here, Moses comes down out of the mountain with the tablets, and there's a hand, person raises their hand, is there a section at the bottom for comments? Even with God, we're expecting to weigh in, right? I've got, you know, I'm a collaborator here, I'm a co-creator. So if we look at these three pieces, I call this organizational structure Peers Incorporated, and I'll explain that a little bit more. And it's people and platforms that are inventing the collab a new collaborative economy and reinventing capitalism, and we're seeing it in every single sector. Um, these companies that you see here, they are ones that you know and love, and they exhibit this organizational structure. I want to tell you a good story about sharing. This is excess capacity, it's all about sharing. And my favorite example is around bed sharing. So get into your minds now, bed sharing. Are you all there? Bed sharing? You'll be knowing where I'm going with this. Um, when I travel, which I do a lot of, if I'm lucky, I get to stay in someone's excess capacity, their kid's room that they no longer are 
is, is available for me. Or it might be their home office. And so here's a nice room that I will stay in. And if I'm really lucky, I get the two double bed. And it's like, yeah, great excess capacity. How fantastic. If I'm unlucky, we have this situation where I'm thinking, I definitely don't want to sleep in those dirty sheets. You know, and that's why I go to a hotel. And hotels really are bed sharing. And I was sleeping in my bed last night thinking about that. Actually, when you lay your head on that pillow, just think, it is bed sharing. How many people have been staying in that hotel? <laughs> I went and did some research to find out the largest hotel chains in the world. The Intercontinental Hotel Group has been around for 65 years, 645,000 rooms in 100 countries. You guys, a lot of finest people in this room, think of the level of effort it took to build that. And you know now my next sentence, which is going to be Airbnb, in its fourth year, had 650,000 rooms to rent in 192 countries. And if you, I just have to do this. Can you believe that? World changing, unbelievable. The world has transformed when we can do things like this. I feel like it's changing capitalism in every way. Couch surfing in its ninth year had two and a half million rooms for rent. This is really, really transforming things. Why is it happening? It's happening because of the internet has now made sharing very small assets and transaction costs has brought them down to zero. So industrial strengths, what we're really, really good at. What do companies and big governments and big institutions like the World Bank do? And they should only focus on these things. They do great big investments, big multi-year efforts, integration of many small parts, deep sector knowledge. These are all things that Robin Chase doesn't have. I can't do any of those big things. Implementing standards and standardization. I can't tell you what to do. I'm just one little individual. You need this big heft to do it. Consistency, brand promise, these are typically local. Conversely, individuals have some fabulous strengths that in the old capitalism they used to have to do. It was painful and annoying. They hated specialization, they hated customization, they hated localization because it was painful and annoying. The internet has taken that annoyance away. So we now, now these two things pair up together. I'm calling this Peers Inc. This is the new partnership that we're seeing in sector after sector after sector and is definitively going to happen. The Inc. side, which are produces the platform for participation, the peers deliver the diversity of offering. Boiling this down, I think of it as a very yin and yang, it's very complementary, you have to share value, there's a synergy between these two sides, and they're swimming in this sea of excess capacity. Um, it's very resource and cost efficient, which is why I really like it. And just to be very quick on excess capacity, so in your work today, you should be looking everywhere for excess capacity. And it is temporal, it is process, it is experiential, it is networks, it is hard assets, the entire sweep. It is something that already exists, already been paid for, and there's more value to be extracted. Open data, that is all about this particular business model. What do you do with, what do you think about when you find this excess capacity? One, you slice it up into little parts, which is what Zipcar do. Two, you aggregate it, which is what Airbnb did. Took all these little parts, made them useful. Three, you open it like open data. So Peers Inc. delivers three miracles. And I'm going to tell you about those miracles. And now I'm going to depress you deeply for the next three minutes so that you appreciate these miracles and where we have to go from here. So the World Bank actually produced this report. Four degrees turned down the heat. And what is the four degrees? The four degrees is if every country does everything it is promised to do, all the promises, by 2100, we'll be plus four degrees average global climate change. And if you're like me, what is plus four degrees average climate change means? I don't know, so I went and did some research. The last time we were minus four degrees was in the last ice age 20,000 years ago. Where I live in Boston and across North America, it was under several kilometers of ice. So picture 20,000 years ago, several kilometers of ice to today, that's the difference of minus of four degrees. The plus four degrees is not going to happen in 20,000 years. It's going to happen between now and 2100, under business as usual. The last time it was plus four degrees Fahrenheit, four degrees centigrade, was between 15 and 25 million years ago. Humans were not a thing. So just get this change into your mind and imagine what is happening. And to make it a little step worse, when we talk about global climate change, that's globally over land, it will be hotter, and the predictions are plus six degrees Celsius, plus 11 Fahrenheit in North America by 2100. That's if we did everything we promised to do. If we don't, that's by 2060. And if it's like that by 2060, which is uninhabitable, it means by 2040, it is terrible. So when people say, do this for your grandchildren, I don't care about my grandchildren. There aren't gonna be any grandchildren. I'm talking about me right now. I intend to live 15 more years. We have to address this right, right, right now. So I'm skipping this next slide. 
So my friend Benny Banerjee, he said, you can't solve exponential problems with linear solutions. This is what we've been doing again and again. We have to step it up, which is why I'm saying try Peers Incorporated. Let me tell you these miracles. The first miracle is we can defy the laws of physics because we are leveraging excess capacity. Now, what do I mean by that? If I go to this Airbnb example, this is what, over if you had a six-year timeline, this is what business as usual asset building looks like. Very slow, one by one. Here is what Airbnb accomplished using excess capacity because all of that stuff exists right now, it can be organized by the platform, boom, it happens. This is what we need to start thinking, much, much higher pace. Etsy is another example. They grew 50% last year. Blah, blah, car. Peer-to-peer, um, yeah, peer-to-peer ride sharing. So going from here to there, they are, they're moving more than two million people every month. They didn't lay one rail car, they didn't buy an airplane, yet they're moving as many people as 5,000 high-speed trains a month and as much as 5,747s a month. We need this kind of speed. It takes a long time to get the platform right. Once you get the platform right, this is what can happen. Miracle number two. Because we are building on top of a platform for participation and the platform is seeing all the activity underneath, we can have exponential learning. I want to tell you about a company called Duolingo, which is free online learning. The standard uni unit for language acquisition is what can you learn in one semester of university, which is 130 hours. Before, before Duolingo existed, it was Rosetta Stone, people at the World Bank who could go get their boss to pay, and rich, wealthy businessmen would buy the Rosetta Stone to learn language. Why? Because it was only 54 hours. How amazing. Only 54 instead of 130. I was talking to the CEO at Duolingo. He can conduct 100 experiments simultaneously with 150,000 people iterating on each experiment, and in 48 hours, he knows precisely how to teach you language better. And he can deliver that same thing in 34 hours. This is really, really robust data. He has 30,000 people taking these different exams, and he has outside people who've done research on, look to them. So explosive learning, which is what we need to be doing. And they have been growing phenomenally. They've actually only been in business for two and a half years. 50 million people were using it in October. It is more people than are learning language in the United States. Okay, miracle number three. Because the participating peers are a diversity of people, and they have such diverse locations and diverse expertise, the right person will appear. It's an incredible miracle. And no, not Superman. If you think about Superman, we are right now so much better than Superman. Superman doesn't have GPS. Superman has no idea how to get from here to there. He doesn't know what the weather is there. He doesn't have any of his buds with him. We have this. So if we look at Waze as an example. So Waze does all the things that you know, and the right person appears. On Thanksgiving, I was driving to New Hampshire in a snowstorm. This isn't my, picture, my photo, but it looked exactly like this. And my son said, we are five people in the car. And he says, wow, look at that. And I thought, oh, a deer is running across the road in the snow. No, it was a car accident right that second. And my husband had his little ways app, and it said, caution, accident ahead. And I think, it is amazing. The person next to me had to have gone into ways and said, yeah, accident ahead. And I'm one and a half seconds behind, and the accident is reported. This can only happen when you have a diversity of peers in different places. So here's Waze's growth, 50 million people. It is just like a phenomenal thing. So now I want to go to um, Uber. How does Uber manage to do what it's doing, its growth potential? Because it is leveraging. It's getting as many as 50,000 new drivers a week, and sometimes it's been quoting. And you have Lyft. In their first two years, they went from zero to 60 cities. You can't do this any other way. You cannot achieve this kind of speed and scale that we, that any other way. And so I want to bring it to a developing country example that I really adore, not developing country, a whatever we call them today, a fabulous country of India. Um, this is my friend Nirmal. G Auto is an auto rickshaw, auto rickshaw company. And if you think of auto rickshaws, where they came from, these were the poorest people of the poor because they were actually doing pulling rickshaws before. They are really low tech. And he developed over five years. He has applied technology in the exact same way that Uber is doing it, exact same way that Lyft is doing it. And he's pulling all these people in, these auto rickshaw drivers in. He now has 15,000 rickshaws in four cities in Delhi four and a half million passengers. And what are the things that he did? He's now doing point to point, of course it's point to point, but he's doing, you can do online reservations. He, trans, he changed all those icky dirty cars into beautiful CNG vehicles because he knew for each individual owner, it's a kind of, it's a cooperative on this platform, for each individual private owner he could tell, he negotiated 
um, low interest rates for, the, for all the rickshaw drivers, and he could tell that financier, I know how this guy drives. He's gonna be coming in, he, he can afford this, this thing. He provides free health care. there's rating systems, so the auto rickshaw drivers are now doing the right thing. They are not, you know, taking you to the wrong place and not having change and doing bad things that we used to hate around auto rickshaw drivers. So this idea of being able to formalize the informal economy, I think is very, very powerful, and when I think of cities around the world, it can happen very, very fast. It requires these platforms for participation. Um, just quickly, uh, U-SHIP is doing the same thing with, with freight. 30% of all freight vehicles are running empty. You ship, you put your excess capacity and onto you ship's platform, and now you can get very, very low cost um, ship freight shipments. So I just want to describe for you why the collaborative economy is coming, this, coming here, why this sharing of assets is happening, and I will go very quickly and then I'm done. It's the future. Why shared networked assets definitely deliver more value than closed proprietary assets. There is no question. More networked minds are way, way smarter than fewer network, unnetworked minds. There's more smart people out of this room, no matter how smart you are, we know it to be de facto. The what, for me as an individual, I always get more than I give. When I write one article for Wikipedia, I now have the entire world's encyclopedia. There's just no, we can't argue with these principles. And the last, it's from a collective standpoint, the benefits of open, shared, networked assets are always dramatically larger than the problems of shared networked open assets. We are now in the moment of a very big transition and you're seeing it happening, it's happening in every single sector. We in the transportation are seeing it. We should go farther, it's happening in governments, it's happening as individuals. Um, thanks. Very inspirational, um, fantastic. Let's move straight to Ana Paula, thank you. Thank you, Robin, that was, that was great. Hi. So thank you. Hi, good afternoon. So that was an incredible presentation and a great introduction to, to what, I'm gonna about, uh, what I'm about to say. So I'm Ana Paula Blanco. I do communications for Latin America. I'm based out of Mexico City, born and raised there. So I live and breathe uh, the, what happens in a city like Mexico City. And Robin just showed us a couple of statistics on how many cars are in Mexico City. We, everyone owns a car. No, it's a thing. It, it, President Calderon actually mentioned it this morning. No, he said, it's a status. We, work towards owning our home and owning our car. So there are two things that the, econom the economics of our cities are actually, we need to rethink the way we aspire, what the things, what are the things that we are aspiring for? And that's where projects like Uber come into mind. Uber in four years has gone into 53 countries, over 268 cities, just in four years. Four years ago, I was driving a car. I was either, I was spending around three hours a day going to or from my home to my office. Four years ago, texting and driving had, in, in the not past four years, texting and driving has become one of the main reasons for accidents around the world. And that is something that we have not realize or come to mind whenever we think about just the issues in transportation, so how people are engaging, how we use a car. And we have taken the person, the human, out of the equation. We talk about transportation as this thing and not about the people who are either using transportation or being surrounded by transportation. This is a snapshot of the city of San Francisco. It, it's just one month and each one of the dots is a drop off from an Uber, an Uber trip. We are serving parts of the city that were underserved, parts of the city where you could not get either public transportation or a taxi. And what does this mean? It's about scale. So whenever we have more scale, we can be ubiquitous. We can have people going, coming and from, going to and from their job to their home. They don't have to be concentrated in one part of the city. They, we can talk about more accessible, housing, about more accessible jobs. We can talk about regaining the territory that we have lost to privately owned cars. This is the city of Chicago, no? And this is just a snapshot, sh snapshot of how Uber is serving 
it's 52% of Uber trips served to underserved areas. And this is very similar to Mexico City. Mexico City is just a year old. Uber has been there for a year and a couple of months. And we can see this specifically. To those of you who have been there, Santa Fe, which is the western part of the city, is very underserved. There are no subways, there are no microbuses, there are no buses. So people used to go to or from with a taxi, you know, which is very, one, it's very expensive. You get charged double or triple the fare you know, to, to whenever you're going. And it's not regulated. There are actually one set of taxis that are called the death taxis. So what they're doing, it's something that we did not invent. They're pooling. They're actually taxi pooling. So they will get as many people as feed in one taxi cab and getting them from, from Santa Fe over to Iztapalapa because there is no public transportation. There is no other means of transportation. But in Santa Fe, that's where the concentration of jobs is actually building up. So people need to get to their job but leave in the opposite side of town and have no other means of getting there. So the snapshot for Mexico City is starting to look very similar to this. The other one is serving the whole city. So the percentage of, of trips that started within 20 minutes, if you can see, this is how fast you can get an Uber, and the other one is how fast, how fast you can get a taxi. And this is the same thing that I was uh, saying at the beginning with the first slide. It's just how much supply how many cars we can have out there on the streets no with more whenever you're car sharing when you're sharing your car with other people when you're putting more cars that are not privately owned but one car that will sell multiple people during the day you're doing a better job at going to more parts of the city because you have more mobility and you have a lot more options to go. And why is this relevant? Because it's very different to sit in your home or at your work and wait for 20 minutes to get whatever you're going. So these are more or less the time frames that Uber has changed in the cities where it's been growing. No, we believe that people should have a safe, reliable, comfortable ride in under five minutes. You should not wait, have to wait 20 minutes to get out ride to wherever you're going. This has an impact in when you're going to work. No, just waiting 20 minutes or having to go whenever everyone's moving at the same time is one of the things that we also should take into consideration. It taps into productivity. No, it can unlock a lot of productivity. President Calderon also mentioned that this morning, whenever you're spending three hours of your day in a crappy ride, or if you're waiting 20 minutes no, to get to your job, that has a direct impact on how productive you're gonna be whenever you get to the place that you're, that you're aiming to get to. Flexibility of the supplies. This is a reality. Texas cannot handle late night demand. And this is a map of Austin, for example. No, it's demand responsiveness. Drivers are compensated in the Uber model you know, to come out onto the road exactly when riders need them. So what happens? This is just a snapshot of a Friday night, everyone you know, going out of the bars, trying to get home at the same time, 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, maybe it's raining, maybe it's not. But it's just like a massive amount of people trying to get the same means of transportation at the same exact time. So it taps into the same thing. There is not enough demand. And what happens is we ride. Either we get our own cars because we know we're not going to be able to get a means of transportation. Maybe the subway is closed down. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. It's not working anymore. And we're not going to get a taxi car because there are so little the same area where we are. So that also taps into people trying to get their cars out there, and it also taps into people who might be inebriated trying to drive their own car back home. You know? So it builds up into the different scenarios where having a model of ride sharing such as Uber tends to put a solution into current, current issues. It also happens when it rains. This is just basic. It happens, right? We come out, we don't, we're not prepared for it, no? And the demand of the taxes tends to lower because it's the same thing, and we we're talking about this. It is very similar to the flight industry and to the hotel industry. Whenever there is more demand, no? The tense, people don't want to work on New York's Eve, no? Who of you would like to go out on a New York's Eve and ride and drive people around? You want to be with your family, you want to stay at home. It's the same thing with a pilot. So that's why we have dynamic 
uh, prices. So we were giving people a choice to have a means of transportation that in a different scheme they would not they would not have that option. They would not be able to get that means of transportation or they would have to drive their own cars. So we see this, how taxis go down because they don't want to ride when it's raining and we tend, because of the model that we've come up with and that we work with our partner drivers to motivate them to drive in those, during those moments where there is less supply. You know? So we're complementing, if you see all of this the maps and the ways we're complementing the rest of the transportation systems in the cities that, that we work in. Expanding mobility. No, we extend access to more affordable housing. Why? This is this is a map of Paris. And if you see the dots, so the center of it is the subway. And all the blue dots are the, the, the rides that we're doing in Uber. As you can see, Uber covers whole swaths of the metropolitan area beyond the heart of the mass transit system. That what this means is that people are able to live farther out, access more affordable housing, and still work in the center of the city. This is a different way of approaching the same scenario. The blue dots are trips that are coming and growing to smaller local businesses that are far away from the city, from the city center. So people are actually getting on the subway and trying to get to maybe that cake shop that is you know, farther away from where they work. You know, and we're incentivizing small local, local businesses that are not able to pay for a prem premium renting space over in the center of the city. And extending public transit networks. This is Paris as well, but Mexico City is very similar. We've, we've started to see the map grow in a very similar way. What does this mean? This means people who are not living in the center of town but are working there. So each one of the blue lines is an Uber trip that is coming from a farther away part of town to one of the furthest subway stations. So it's complementing, instead of using your own car to go all the way downtown or parking inside, no, uh, on, in town, you are actually taking an Uber, going to the subway station, and then doing the rest of your trip in public on public transportation. Uber pool. And this is not something that we invented, right? This is something we've been doing for ages. We're just doing it more efficiently and with data. So what? A lot of us had our moms drive us around and they were pulling their cars to get us to school, right? So this is something that we know is more efficient. You know, we, maybe one had a bigger van and she was in charge of pulling everyone to uh, like the soccer league team on a Saturday morning, or maybe we're pulling over to school. So it's the same concept, but what happens when you have other people, and we do this as a community. It's not with the people that you know, but you're doing it more efficiently thank you, thanks to technology. So what this gives you is you know exactly who has a car, who's going to what's point A, what's point B, and you start getting information on who needs a ride along the way, you know, up to the point where you when you're ending your trip. But this line can go on and on and on exponentially until like with as many stops as needed until point B. So you're taking off the streets at uh, town cars, but you're making it more efficiently because it's not a word of mouth organization, but it's actually through technology that you know, and you do have a GPS and you do know what the, the route is gonna be. So you're using one car instead of putting so many cars with just one person in it, in them driving. So this is more or less a concept of how many cars you're taking off the streets. Instead of having that many cars, particular cars with one person in them, you have four, three, four people riding on the same car and taking cars off the streets. Just gonna breeze through that one. And this is a different concept. Robin also talked about this, and I think it's it's very relevant. Uh, as I said, I've been I was born and raised in Mexico City, so I know about parking. I live in an area where actually people don't even they don't even park near the sidewalk. They park on top of the sidewalk. No, we just ate them. We don't have pedestrian walks. No, so 
just in San Francisco, and this is the snapshot, 50 million square feet of public and curbside parking. That's also premium land. What could we be doing with all of this parking space? Instead of owning, for example, we buy a house that has a parking space. No, there's a, a different kind of economy also where people who have parking spaces but don't have cars are actually renting that space for people who have not only one but two or three privately owned cars. No, so we could be doing so much more if we freed that space and instead of doing public public parking spaces, Governor Maceda was mentioning this morning for Mexico City even has 60% of the city is, um, is green areas. We, you cannot build on top of those areas. So you're using space in that 40% of the city that you can actually build on, and there's a lot of land that's being used for parking cars and just having them sit there. We could do a lot more with those, building more pedestrian walks or green areas. And the, the last point I wanna make is global connectedness. We want the same experience. If you have a seamless ride over in Mexico, I haven't, I haven't driven in two years. No, the first time I took a taxi was two weeks ago in Santiago because I couldn't get an Uber. I want the same seamless experience when I come to Washington, when I go to Santiago, and in my everyday life in Mexico City. And that is relevant. And that's one of the things that data can also do for you and can do for the cities. We can make the experiences you know, be of better connectedness and of more better connected us in every single one of the cities that we work on. So that's basically what you have. It's not only for the people who are living there, but it's also for the people who are traveling back and forth. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, I think we have a lot of thoughts, but I first want to make sure that we get to our other speakers. And thank you so much. Excellent presentations, very thought provoking. Um, Dr. O, oh, could you just, uh, for a couple of minutes, just introduce to us what you and your institute are doing uh, in this whole space of technology and innovation in sustainable transport? Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I think, as you know well, uh, in, in these days, uh, of course, more than 100 years, uh, people live in a car-oriented society, car-oriented time. Also, people are very much habituated with the car, car culture, car life, as you see. So the, this car-oriented, car-habituated life produce, generate a lot of problems. Let's say, let us uh, uh, make some several statistics for our better understanding, for agreement. First of all, economically, uh, every household, on average, every household spend 18, 15 to 18% 18 of house budget for transport expenses. And also, about 40% of the urban space are directly or indirectly related to, uh, entitled to uh, the highway space or parking space, something like this. So it's, this is a very, very, very bad for life. And thirdly, uh, thirdly we use 24 hours, out of 24 hours, we use cars only for two hours. The rest 22 hours are in parking. So I think this is the exactly the, 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 the most fundamental reason why the car sharing is justified. So the also most importantly, the car oriented society produce generate a lot of the lives lost or injured, and then it creates a lot of the the what is the, the external uh, economies for the to individual for the whole society as well you see so can technology help either to reduce or mitigate such problems i think i think i in in this uh, moment uh, i say yes i think but uh, it will take a 
very long time, I think. Uh? So the, uh, this afternoon, we, we had uh, two very excellent uh, presentations uh, about the car sharing, peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, and Uber. And uh, for example, five, five years ago, this kind of the transportation service uh, existed uh, as an idea, but was not, uh, not a reality. But now this is the, this, this car sharing transportation service uh, become one of the very innovative and competitive service uh, in the market already, you see? So it's the, the technology change the transportation service, transportation system very, very, very rapidly, I think. Uh, so the, uh, but the, in Korea, we also, the, there is uh, some, a lot of argument about the, the, how this, the permit of the business permit of Uber, you see? So the, there are, in Korea, it is illegal for a moment, but I don't know in the future. So the, uh, according to my understanding, there are four, four arguments, four problems to be solved for, for this kind of the innovative service to be used, uh, to be used in, in, in our society. First problem is legality problems. This legality is directly related to the existing taxi or transport mode market, service market. So this, is, this creates a lot of the social conflict. This is another problem. We have to solve these problems, okay? The second problem is still people worrying about the vehicle safety problems because government cannot control the Uber vehicles thoroughly. So this is the vehicle safety problem, vehicle or driver safety problems. So the problem is the security problems. Human security, also the, the payment security. This security problem, security is also uncertain. Possibly is more, more or less likely the insurance. Insurance is not guaranteed. So the, the innovative service like Uber, uh, we, we have to solve these problems. Uber or car sharing has a lot of the competitiveness and the merit to be developed, to, to be progressed in the future. Actually, I have, uh, uh, about five years ago, I was very much motivated by the Robin Chase uh, about the Jeep cars. Uh, so I, 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 I conducted uh, one or two years uh, research about this. And then at that time, uh, I, my, my research idea was like this. In Korea, car sharing might be very difficult it only by itself, okay? So what, what my idea was at that time should be linked, should be combined, integrated with public transportation, network of public, public transportation service. So, so the, the control center, information and operation control center should provide some more integrated journey planning service, including information, what is the payment or the scheduling, etc. cetera. So, so, the, so, so the, this car sharing or Uber can contribute to improve, to increase public transportation use for the whole society to deal with the, the, what is the, the, the externality produced by, produced by the, what is the, the, the car-oriented society, you see? So I think in, in general, in general, the future innovative transport system should, should be related to uh, some important indexes, some Im important quality indexes. Uh. First one is uh, traffic congestion, congestion reduction. Second thing is the environment uh, or green transport. Third, third thing is uh, traffic safety. Fourth thing is uh, 
the increasing increased the the efficient operation efficiency of the existing transport uh, infrastructure or big systems. Uh, also, more importantly, we have to provide uh, the 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 what is the the cost effective and uh, safe and uh, convenient uh, public transport service. So the, I hope in the future, car sharing and Uber should contribute, to, should related to this kind of quality services for the, for the whole, whole society and also whole classes of people, I think. So the, in my mind, in my un un understanding, the, we have the car sharing and Uber has a very, uh, has a merit from the, the whole individual freedom of the car use. Also, it should be connected with the public transport and then we create a new transport. I named it uh, such a innovative, futuristic innovative transport is the, the cloud transport system, okay? It's, it's a little bit funny, the, 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 the copied from the cloud computing, but anyway, I, my idea is the car sharing and Uber should be connected with, uh, should be integrated with, uh, within with uh, the, the public transport system. And then it will reduce the use of the, the what is the car traffic, and then reduce the, the what is the, 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 the accident, uh, and then also the reduce the, the, the environment, the, the, the damage, yes, okay? Okay, later, if I have uh, one more time for to speak, I will introduce some experimental uh, examples uh, uh, currently the, uh, taking uh, in Korea and also my research institute. Thank you very much Thank for you, your Dr. understanding. Thank you, Dr. Oh. Yeah. Very nice, and the, the whole, con I think I love the words, the cloud transport system, but Dr. O oh reminded us of the desired impacts of technology and shared mobility, the barriers that we're seeing uh, is particularly in Korea to some types of innovation like, like Uber. Um, and, then, and then made the important point, we must make sure to integrate with public transport. Mm -hmm. um, Hussein, in Istanbul, you're doing big things and innovating. Can you share just a bit about the latest news uh, to bring everybody up to speed on, on what's happening? All right. Uh, let me summarize Istanbul's uh, current situation. Istanbul is a 14 million population and we have uh, around 3.5 million cars, and 66% of them are private cars, and each day, 458 cars enter in the traffic. So we have lots of, lots of traffic in Istanbul. Our company, IATT, is responsible of operating buses. We operate uh, 6,000 buses, and we also operate a metro bus system, it's BRT, bus rapid transit system. Uh, we put, we established this system in the busiest corridor of Istanbul, and it now carries around 800,000 passengers daily. It consists of 52, 52 kilometers, and it saved average of one hour you, uh, to people uh, which, who are using previously on this road. And I'd like to uh, mentioned a little bit about using technology, how, how uh, we can create something very useful for people with little effort with using technology. In Istanbul, uh, we, we used to, we already have a GPS and GPRS system in our buses, and, but we use this only for our management purposes, not for the users for passengers, and last year, we have developed an app which shows uh, for smartphone users where is the bus at the map and when, is, when it is common uh, to, do per, uh, to the particular bus stop. In less than a year, the app uh, got lots of applause and now uh, more than one million users use 
now this app. People uh, save lots of time with the app, using the app. People uh, can set a reminder with the uh, selected bus and stay home, save time. Uh, they don't have to get cold, rain, or hot. And with this app, uh, today we have received a technology award from our National Assembly. That's, that's for... Uh, Congratulations, great stuff. And one thing I think is so interesting about this is imagine any other infrastructure project that would save virtually every transit user in Istanbul, a very big city, some time, and how much that might cost and how long that would take to implement. And then compare that to the app, which was implemented with probably some intense developments, but uh, overnight. Software, that's it. It's software, right? That's it. And within a year, everybody's using it. Right. It's fantastic. Shomik, um, also on the subject of transit planning and operations, tell us more about what you and the bank have been working on. You know, what I'll do here, first of all, Clayton, thanks, and thanks all the speakers. I certainly learned a lot today, and I'd like to, if I could, instead of talking about what we are doing so much, just comment on a couple of things. Great. And I think the first thing to do is shared mobility clearly. I think I'm a believer. Robin is as inspiring as anyone I've ever heard. But I have to say, shared mobility is not the only thing that's going on in technology. And I want to just say a couple of things just to round off what we are doing. I think Hussein talked about some things. But you know, technology is letting us do things that we've been trying to do for a long time and not being successful at, do it better. And, and the most obvious example is targeted subsidies in public transport. You know, we used to subsidize the people we could identify, not the people who needed subsidies, but now, with a combination of smart cards, the social infrastructure, we are uh, subsidizing the poor, able to identify them and subsidize them. Okay, this is one very nice thing we can do. One uh, very nice thing, you know, you talked about some things we can do, but I'm hoping that, you know, uh, Robin didn't talk about her new startup, uh, Valium, but I'm hoping that with the internet of uh, things, with more and more ubiquitous sensors, we will be able to find alternative solutions to Mayor Mancera's problems with the 30,000 microbuses that is incremental, that is more consistent with uh, building on the strengths of an agile market-based system rather than uh, what we do now, which is to completely disrupt that system. So I think technology, sensors, smart cards, uh, open data are fundamentally transforming uh, our world in ways that are uh, very interesting and yet distinct from uh, shared mobility. Another thing that I think is worth talking about is the manner in which uh, technology is allowing us, uh, maybe not subvert, but at least lower the barriers to traditional transport planning. You know, my, my colleagues uh, Diego and Tatiana were in uh, one month ago in Cairo where we are trying to appraise a project but we didn't know any of the buses went. And in one week they sat down with the drivers using one of these tools, Transit Mix, uh, to map every single uh, uh, bus route in the city. GTFS, open data, allow people to develop the apps uh, and to use these apps for journey planners and for different kinds of tools of different kinds. You know, doing a traditional OD survey used to take millions of dollars and in many of our places it was just uh, a combination of different problems that led to very mediocre results. Now we are trying to work with call detail records, CDRs, from telephones uh, in, uh, with professors at MIT, and lots of people are doing that now uh, to try and break that down. There are uh, examples of other tools. Uh, we have created, uh, my colleague Holly here has created open data-based tools for accidents in uh, Southeast Asia. We've developed, uh, we're all developing tools. Uh, you did your uh, thesis on accessibility to be able to uh, find computationally easy ways to do accessibility. So I think there's a whole range of tools and you know, really what we want to do is find ways to lower the barriers to every element of transport planning. And I think that's happening. I think that's very important. I I'll say one thing, or a couple of things now if I could on the shared mobility and the shared economy. I, I think Inspiring though it is, you know, somehow we all know that the story is not absolutely as beautiful as Robin drew it. Because there's a lot of gaming in the system, okay? And I think 
uh, you know, half my colleagues uh, are, are very strong on regulation of hotels and, you know, they should treat their workers right, they should treat, uh, make sure that the bed sheets are clean and, you know, all of that needs to be regulated and, and, and we are, you know, all very strong uh, World Bank people, very pro-regulation uh, of different kinds. But at the same time, we are also very pro uh, in, in shared economy players that, uh, you know, often may be renting out their spare bedroom when uh, they are not there, but often uh, could be the new slumlords that are buying five or six apartments and renting them out. You know, we have to figure out, and there's a lot here, or there's something here that, that's conceptual that I haven't come to grips with. And I think, uh, you know, I, I was left uh, after listening to this saying that, look, you know, there's something here. And I think this is something that everyone has to explore as we get to the bottom of a shared economy. And I love Uber. I mean, I, I've used it in eight countries. I'm, I'm, I'm probably eight of those. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's a public interest, and, and I'll say good and bad. I think for, for the good, we have uh, many, many products, many, many markets that we are not able to serve that I hope that Uber can help us with. Uh, thin markets, you know, late at night when people are not safe. These are markets where demand responsive uh, with all the efficiency really helps. Uh, and, and despite all the bad news Uber has had on this, security, uh, secure transport for women under stress. This has got to be one of the most uh, game-changing things, uh, that, you know, uh, appearance of Uber for that. At the same time, you know, the fundamental interest of a transport planner in a city is to address congestion. And that's the reason we uh, uh, limit the number of taxis. It's not because the city wants to make money out of medallions. And with Uber, we are in a situation where that fundamental duty of a city to regulate the amount of supply of taxis is out of our hands. So until we get into the business of getting speed data from Uber and starting to think about how that is the basis for a new regulatory regime for pricing uh, use of public infrastructure, I think uh, we have a fundamental issue that we have to resolve. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that was provocative enough to stop. Very, very nice. <laughs> so I'd, I'd like to pose a question to all of you, but, but since Uber was mentioned by a few of us, I'm sure <laughs> you've got some thoughts on it. Uh, any quick response to those before I move us forward? I mean, if you have any thoughts here on barriers, on doubts, and so on. Sure. Um, absolutely. So I, I think a couple of things that were mentioned, and maybe I'll, I'll tap a little bit into, into security and regulation. No, th definitely, this is something extremely new. No, and we'll be talking about this. Innovation precedes legislation. So there is no way I had this conversation in Colombia a couple of weeks back, no, and say, why don't you wait until legislation is out there so you can operate? It's like, well, there, there won't be any legislation because this didn't exist in the 90s. We're the last transportation regulation was made. So there is no way you can actually work around how do you regulate an app when smartphones were not even in the picture, right? So there are a lot of conversations, and to today we, we, uh, we heard this morning about debate. We need to debate these topics. Now there's a lot of conversations that we have to put on the table regarding the new realities that we have. We weren't that many, we weren't that concentrated in the large uh, cities that we have, you know, so um, there were not that many privately owned cars out in the streets, and there were no solutions to a lot of these this issues. We, we never thought about GPS in the buses, you know, why would you need you no know, technology to tell you which route or when or if it was going to be late because it's raining or not, you know, or if there was an accident ahead of you, it just, you were just waiting 20 minutes to know about this, you know, and then when the bus ca uh, got there, you knew there was an accident, or you, you knew what was going on, but technology was no were in the picture 20 years ago when legislations were being made. So we definitely want to be part of the conversation. We definitely want to be regulated. It's just having the right kinds of conversation on how regulation puts, and I, and I said this previously, puts the person in the middle of the conversation. It's not just about the buses or transportation as a thing, as this material thing that we're just part of. We are the ones that are in the middle of it. No, we're the ones either using the car, driving the car, no, being either the, the driver, the rider, or the 
the pedestrian walking in the street, and we have to be the ones that are deciding which is the what is the new city that we want to live in. What does it look like, and why do we choose to use a bike to work? And if so, maybe you no. Know, if I live really far away, if there are no. Uh, bike lanes for me to go to, no, but maybe closer to my office there are, I need a car that has a place for me to put my bike in, no, or the Metrobus where you can go on, on it with your bike and then bike to work. Th there's, there's a complementary position to the way different kinds of transportation in the city apply to every one of us. No, we're not, people in the cities are not just one standard kind of person. No, that only uses a bike or only works or only uses a privately owned car or only goes on, on the subway. We do have different necessities and we're different people whenever we're moving to different parts. No, or, or doing our business in, in it be it during the weekday or be, be it during the, the, the weekend. And the other thing that I would like to comment on is security, which was also uh, mentioned. And I think that was, that's definitely one thing that I, that I do want to put in the front of the conversation. I think that uh, a couple of the things that happened in the past months were very painful learning experience for us. And because in the past four years, we've been operating, now we're in 53 countries, 268 cities. And fortunately enough, it, it's, it's been the less of the experience. There were very, I can count them with one hand, no, fortunately enough. But we need to keep on doing better and more things to put security out there. Definitely, and me as a user, as I said, I've been using this for a year and a half, and why? Because I did not drive at night. I was scared to go out in my own car, and it did put me back into a conversation. I, I own the way I move around in the city. No, now I am in charge if I wanna go out at night, and I've seen this with, for example, um, the kids of my friends. You know, the guys who are 18, 20, that are going out at night, and especially the girls, you know, they don't have to wait around for someone else to drive them or for the drunk boyfriend you know, to get a cab at night because she was left at the bar because her friends left or whatever. We have different options. And it's a conversation that I've had with a couple of, of my, my friends but we need to do more. Security is an issue, and what happened is we were, um, we were depending solely into what governments were giving us. So for example, background checks in most of our countries were done uh, only, um, we're only asking for a certificate of non-criminal records. No? And in a lot of countries, that's not enough. And as, as we learned the hard way, this can be falsified, and we can get information that's not accurate, and we need to work with the governments to make better you know, background checks. And there are other countries where we knew this happened, like Mexico City, where a background check includes a psych evaluation, you know, and it's, it's very hard to be an Uber driver in a lot of the cities. We need to put a lot more thought and discussion into how we better this, not only for Uber, but for the whole industry. I'd like to ask you all an important question. I think this is a great example of, of some of the, of the difficulty, the challenges in just this one model, but there are many models here. Um, we've heard a lot of great arguments for how technology is making a difference or how shared mobility can and visions for that today. Um, but my question is, how transformative is this really? Are we on the cusp of really a transformation in transportation or or are we just really talking about enhancing things at the margin? And on the positive side, I, I want to highlight some of the really, really cool stuff we've heard today. I, I love what you said earlier, Robin, how you characterized on one of the later slides uh, that we're getting more together. And, and we've heard examples of that today from uh, Anna Paula showing better serving the underserved, um, higher quality of service measured in various ways. We've heard also from Hussein about uh, um, how people can get information now, real time, to improve their quality of service. Um, also, we've heard this theme about scale, that we can, we've been able to scale up these innovations so quickly. Uh, Robin mentioned um, Airbnb now exceeding the size of all the other hotel chains in the world in a much shorter time. We've heard about 50,000 new drivers per month in Uber, or again, how quickly the users in Istanbul have, have, uh, have started using the service. Uh, we've also heard about how technology is helping us to improve planning, whether it's measuring accessibility better, uh, whether it's um, helping paratransit minibuses do better. At the same time, let's just be frank here, um, things have not transformed so much yet, right? The number of people who are using these, these services, the number of trips in the whole market of transport remains very small. 
cities are congested, pollution is high, people do not have access to adequate service. So is this just something at the margin, or is this really leading to a big sea change? So I'd love for any of you, if you have any thoughts on this, I, I would just love to hear your thoughts, and then I'd really love to preserve some time for the audience to ask some questions. What I understand from here, uh, the private cars cause traffic and invades our most valuable space in our cities. So as a result, they kill in our cities uh, constantly and slowly. Uh, what's the solution? What I understand from here, solution, uh, shared taxis, taxis, shared cars, shared bike systems and public transport somehow converge, collaborate, work together, and support each other. That's what I understand from solution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you think the integration could be transformative yeah, to together. Be. Mm -hmm. And Dr. O, you were saying this earlier as well. Yes? Yeah? Uh, can I? Please, yes. I, no, no, no. I, time is very limited, so the, I like to introduced to the, the experiments huh? okay. uh, carried out. Uh, no, in before you question. start, yeah. is it related to the questions that I just asked? No. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry let's, about let's that. Let's finish that discussion. Uh, I think okay, we can okay. come back. Okay. Um, any other ideas on this? Yeah. Um, one of the things just as we think about this, so I definitely think that technology and, of course, access to cell phones and access to smartphones will make this all easier each time. But it's one of the things that I, I just want to keep reminding us is not so shared vehicles will take the parking out of the system, but it's shared trips that take the volume of vehicles out of the system. Mm -hmm. And so we have to keep reminding ourselves. And, and so it's you have this amount of space on the street. And we were just discussing at lunch today one of the challenges around congestion, and I want to say congestion, 80% of trips are single occupancy, and that includes taxis. One taxi driver, one dr person is single occupancy, and I'm surrounded in this big, giant vehicle. We need to get the vehicle-sized things filled with the capacity of people, and we need to get people into vehicles or mobility that is very close to the size and shape of my body. Not so, an you know, me walking, me in a bike, me in an electric bike, me in an enclosed motorized vehicle that is just the size of one person or one and a half people. But that is, I feel like those are dramatic things. And I, mm. I, I believe technology is going to take us down some of these paths, but others, as we know, is going to be cities having the will to say, on our streets, this is what's going to be allowed in this lane, and this is what's going to be in this lane. Until we make that bite, it's really hard to make this transition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So technology is an enabler, but we're not there yet. And technology will enable. We'll work all around all the corners, but it keeps and will improve things. Mm -hmm. We'll have more shared vehicles, and we'll have more shared trips and shared vehicles. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to move fast, we have to say this lane is only vehicles that are the size of one human. Let me say, you know, say it a little differently, perhaps. You know, a lot of people think of Uber or the TNCs as the sharing economy, as, as this big explosion of the sharing economy. It's also the first time, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a transport planner's dream also. <laughs> you know why? <laughs> because all our lives, we've all wanted to do congestion pricing. And for the first time, we have a fleet of vehicles on the road which have GPSs that tell you not only where they are, but how much congestion they're causing. <laughs> hey, man. This, if, if we could have done this, I would have made sure every car had this. I don't, I don't, I mean, you, you just take the whole sharing economy out of Uber. It's still the most wonderful thing in terms of the future from a wait, regulatory point. Wait, 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 wait. Can I have to, can I discuss here? Sure, sure. <laughs> Shomik, I just want to tell you guys that Shomik, I think, is one of the first, I'm trying to remember, 100 Zipcar members? Seven. Number 700? Seven. <laughs> number seven, okay? So, so <laughs> Shomik, Shomik is right up there um, with caring about shared transportation. But look at Waze, Shomik. That is doing exactly that same piece, which in, in 50 million people and all their trips and their personal cars. So I don't think it's just Uber is doing the GPS piece. You need to be able to charge, not in terms of the information. Um, 
and then around, so the charging, so they're charging for that congestion, and then um, a piece that I, we talked about what are the pluses and minuses of all of the shared economy, so yes, we need to deal with insurance. I think that can be done by the government. We need to say what are our safety standards, and that can be done. Um, things that the platforms can be doing is to be much more transparent about their multiples of pricing. And so something I'm yearning for Uber to do is they're doing a supply demand, I don't know if you guys know, so the price goes up based on demand in theory, but it's all hidden. So I'd, I'd like to know, when I today when I double the price of the taxi, I get 5% more drivers, and if I triple it, I get... 15% more, I want to know, I want to see that curve. So I want to know when you go from three times pricing to seven times pricing, when you went to seven times pricing, did you get one more person? Like they didn't come at six times, you had to go seven times? I'd like to be able to see that. And then to Shomik's um, other piece around the supply side, I, as a, one of the reasons they created medallions was in fact to guarantee an income to the drivers to make sure that you didn't have too many drivers so that I could get an, a minimum, a workable minimum va wage. And with these um, shared taxi services, there isn't a restraint on that, on that supply. So I think once the word gets out, and it is getting out, anybody with a car and license can become a driver, so we can see those things, those plummet. So I feel like there's, we can address those problems through more data visibility. Hey, you know what? There's 2,586 taxis. Do not come in. Really brief? Yes, Paula? very brief. No, but and, and to your point, and, and that's exactly one of the experiments that we're doing with the city of Boston, because I, I definitely think data is the power behind this. No, and, and there are things and we can be very transparent. No, but as as soon as we start seeing and understanding how either um, dynamic you no know, uh, pricing, you no know, actually urges more drivers to get on the street, you no know, how much money we get, and actually how many people, and we did this ex experiment in Guadalajara just recently, for two weeks, just in December. We wanted to know how many people were actually just driving alone, or how many were Uber pooling without Uber pool, just like in a regular Uber car. And we actually found out that over 80% of our riders were pooling on an Uber. They were mm. splitting the fare, you no, know, mm. and they're doing without without us having the actual Uber pool uh, platform out there in Guadalajara, they were doing it with an Uber car. So there's a lot to learn and still you know from the way we are using the platforms that are, are available for us and what makes more sense. And to the point, and that's why you talk more about Uber Pool rather than the rest of the our platforms because that's where you actually see the change. That's when you see more cars leaving you know, the, the streets, and that's where it's more um, it's right sharing and actual rights, not only the car, but the rights, how many times you're using car. And the other one, and this is just an example, we talked about COP16 this morning, and that's what Google did. They took 20 years of data, mm -hmm. no, and showed that, that Mexico was the only country to give them all of their data, and they processed 20 years, and they were able to see how the kind of defor deforestation that they had, why was it? Was it illegal deforestation? Was it just like climate changing or not? But that was the power of data and the power of the way you were uh, analyzing the data, no, and that's what we need to do, but that was 20 years of information. Right now, just Uber, we only have four in general in each one of the cities, for example, Mexico City, just one year. So there's a lot more that we can do as we evolve. But it is a very interesting point that there's a tremendous amount of data and opportunity. What I thought you were going to say before, Shomik, was you have all of these users who are opting in to pay by the mile or pay by the hour. <laughs> that is, in a way, congestion charging. I really want to hand it off to the audience here, so please, if you could just I'll line up at the mic, be brief. I want to take several questions here. Uh, so please, Mary Vaughn, go ahead. Yes, uh, you, you have provided information of uh, offer. I'm a user, and I have to hunt for all the websites of all these services. What I need, and what I need to jump into the new technology, one is to have multimodal. I want to go to transforming transportation. I can't arrive after 9.5. Uh, how much does it cost me what you offer, a bit of a bike plus a bit of a car plus the metro? I would do all these things if I would get an offer, but I haven't heard the client. You are managing your own data, thank you very much, but myself, I'm <laughs> the user, I'm totally confused. Instead of two options, my car and the bus, now I have seven, and I don't know how to choose. I want to have the cost, the price, the risk, the amount of money and the time. There is an app for that. Yes. <laughs> Let me take the next question first. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rafael. I'm from York University in Toronto, Canada. 
And uh, my question is actually in regards to uh, what I see here is uh, competing with public transportation. And then does car share in this case uh, reduce the responsibility of the, uh, of the uh, pretty much of the state to provide public transportation? And um, usually public transportation, most systems already operate at a loss. Um, so what is the risk in car shares uh, in uh, financing future of growth of public transportation? Great question. One. And I just want to take one question, maybe two, from the rear mic. Hi, I'm Bibiana McHugh from TriMet in Portland, Oregon. And there is actually technology to integrate transit with car sharing, with biking. Um, we use Open Trip Planner. And um, we actually did a pilot several years ago with Zipcar um, using their data to plan transit trips to um, uh, car share locations returning in one trip itinerary. And I'd like to know if there's any initiatives any of you could speak on in bringing um, car sharing data open to the public, um, perhaps in APIs, perhaps using the same format similar to GTFS. Great. And let me, let me take one more, and then I'll hand it back here. Please. Okay. Um, uh, the fellow okay. So I'm, I'm a, a big fan of car sharing because I love the idea of getting um, getting rid of the parking, especially. Um, but just to provide like some sense of the scale of the problem and the scale of the solution, I, I think it's too easy to fall into the trap of thinking that you're going to solve the world, you save the world with this approach. You know, and, and the example I like to use is that if you you could replace um, put a six line a six car red line train in in Boston, if you you could by putting another one of those in service, you could take. Uh, six miles of traffic off of Massachusetts Avenue, um, six miles of one lane of traffic. So all the car sharing in the world isn't going to have the same kind of impact as really good wow. public transit. Um, so then the question is, in terms of the positive impact of car sharing, it seems like the jury's out on whether it's going to reduce or increase vehicle miles traveled. Um, I've heard conflicting things about that. Um, and because you are providing a service to people that might not have the ability to use cars at all. Um, so I'm just curious if there are any good studies or any suggestions for how to make sure that it actually does reduce vehicle miles traveled. So that's a lot of material for us here. I'm going to just ask you, you know, where interesting or you've got some expertise or knowledge um, to respond here. Just to remind you, where is that app that helps me find how I'm getting, <laughs> using all these eight or 14 modes, uh, the financial sustainability of these things, the impact they really can have? I'll try to be really fast. Um, comparing car sharing to transit use, everything has to do with the exact trip you want to be taking, and no one is taking a zip car to work, period, ever. So it, you can't compare those things. We need to have multimodal things happening. Um, uh, around sharing the data, I think a lot comes down to this uh, open data piece. And there are apps that are doing this multimodal stuff, Ride Scout. There's many, many apps, but one of the challenges around the apps for me as an entrepreneur is I'm thinking, that's great, now you've got an app and I've got my new startup and you're never, I'm not going to be in the app and I'm going to be completely washed out because you've got these apps who've made deals with three people. And it makes me, it's very anti-competitive, so I don't like that. Tim Berners-Lee has been working on something called Linked Data, which is you think of subject, verb, object, and so Robin, by transit, you know, Robin moving to someplace, and if you publish your data for your, your system in that subject verb object thing, when you did a search, it would come up all of the options. Payment is getting more simplified, um, whatever. But in general, I think we need much more open data around where we're gonna have car sharing data because of competitive reasons. Yeah, Zipcar is never gonna make us data. I don't speak for Zipcar anymore. Avis bought it, but I know they won't be doing that. Um, we do need to have laws around privacy for all of this stuff. I'd love to have, you know, give your transport data to the world day so that we can just mm. get all of that stuff in good form and then maybe do it once a year. Iterate. Um, any responses also to the questions on financial sustainability of these new... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Can yeah? I respond one thing about the uh, whether zip car, car sharing adds or subtracts? The best shared cars are only putting about 7,000... 17,000 miles a year per car. Those cars are being shared by actively being shared, not the membership numbers, actively being shared by about 30 people. So you do the math, it is way, way less vehicle miles traveled than if those people own their own cars. And even when you look at the whole group, so 30 people with 17,000 miles less than if any number of those people owned cars. Show me. Yeah, I, I, I just say that, look, uh, you know, Boston, DC, New York is one thing. But you know, I work in Rio, Sao Paulo, Bogota, Johannesburg, in these places, we've, you know, part of it is our fault, but there's a lot more that needs to be done to improve public transport before people who can afford to take it, uh, afford to drive, 
really consider public transport. You know, this is a dirty little truth. Let's, uh, let's, let's admit it. What we do primarily at the moment is to try and improve the quality of service for captive riders so we can get to a point where public transport is a real choice for people who have a choice. So if you're really trying to reduce cars for people who have a choice, you know, it's a different market. And we've tried these TDM things in Mexico. We've tried them in Sao Paulo. And really, the key is you have to offer them a less damaging car a less damaging trip. When I say damaging, I mean environmentally damaging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the market we're talking about. So I don't see this as uh, something that is in conflict with public transport. I see it as a compliment. Dr. Ko? Y yes. I, uh -huh. I mean, the, the, I, I want the car sharing to be harmonized, to be the complemented with the public transportation system. You know the why people don't like uh, to use the public transport, one of the, the biggest barriers is transport, transport inconvenience. So I think the car sharing can be helped, can be the, what is the, 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 uh, acting as a kind of the feeder function for the longer trip of the public transportation system, which is very cheap and very competitive, very a convenient uh, service uh, for the the as a as a, as a feeder system. So I don't see any. Uh, so it's up to our the policies. Huh? So I, I don't see any the financial the what is the the conflict uh, with the, between the the car sharing and the public transport uh, in the future. Yeah. And and in fact, I think all of these modes can only survive and thrive because there is a strong public transport system. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in response to the question about impact, there have been many studies on classic two-way car sharing showing reduced vehicle kilometers traveled, reduced car ownership, more environmentally friendly travel. But there's been very little, if any, research on a lot of the newer uh, modes of shared mobility. We don't know the impact of one-way car sharing, of the TNCs, and so on. And, uh, and data certainly will be helpful in research to find out the answer. I'm going to take one last question, and that's it. Please be really brief, and one response from here, and we'll wrap up. Salvini. Uh, this is a question for Robin. Um, uh, we are in Guadalajara, Mexico, and we're trying to make what you mentioned this morning about bringing together all the hombre camión with the men and the boss and to put all together an economy, a shared economy. But they're very, they don't want to do it. They're you know, distrustful of the government. and. Actually, our politicians are not very trustful people either. So um, we are just, we're a firm and we're a consultant firm and we are technology providers and we're always close to, we're in 118 cities uh, throughout Mexico and Latin America. Um, but they don't want to do it. They just, they just, you know, I, I do my own buzz and I do my own. And you talked about three miracles and I just wanted to ask you, what is the, like the miracle inside of a, mind, a culture, or what is like the inception that it has to be behind all this new way of sharing prosperity? Um, I will be really quick. If you think of that Piers Inc. side by side, all of those drivers are the Inc. side, and you need to provide them things that they could never do themselves. And so you're negotiating great insurance rate. You're negotiating bulk fuel deals. You're finding them the passengers and using fancy user, getting them fancy user apps. That's why people are using Uber because I'm an individual. I can't do marketing. I can't make an app. I can't create a critical mass. And so you really need to, to play on that parity. And so they will definitely want to do it because they're getting what they can't do. To say kind of more simply, these platforms are giving the individual the power of the corporation. Each one of us now has the power of the corporation. And it's a phenomenal thing we're handing them. And you can't do it any other way. So there is, there is absolutely a value share that there's a one, one of the things about the Omri Canrion, and I was talking to some limo drivers, and one thing that they liked about Uber versus going for black car companies, and all has to do with the algorithm, is that the, this my driver, my Uber driver is telling me he worked for limo service, and what he hated was the guy who got the call in the limo service was the guy's cousin who had worked there for 25 years, and he's a new person, and he's only just come, but he said, with these apps, I know this is, this is the rule, and if I'm the closest car, I get the trip. And so, those kinds of, so taking the politics out of it, taking your best friend's cousin out of it. Like, if you're the closest guy, you're, you got it. Thank you. Thank you.
I think we've had a fantastic discussion here, really brief to summarize. I think we can safely say that transport will be very different in the future the way we, because of technology, the way we plan transport, the way we operate it, and the way we use it. But whether that's going to be transformative depends on what we make of it. It's still an unanswered question. I want to thank you, the panelists, very much, the audience for your excellent questions. This has been, has been really fun. Thank you so much.